here. Give people a little time to come on. Let's go over here to this page and we'll share it a few places while we wait. Did your phone? Um, yeah, I have my, on. my volume is on. I'm gonna turn it off now. I see you're live. We are live. Hey, everybody. We are here. Getting ready. You see Kathleen Mandeville is here. There we are. I see us. We're on the Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And oh, good. Good. we will be starting our talk in just a few minutes. I'm going to share this to my personal page and just give everybody time to come on. Here we go. Kathleen, good to see you tonight. Tim, it's great to see you. I'm excited for this conversation. Oh my God, so much has happened around this little interview project in the last three or four days. It's kind of exciting. Yeah. There we go. I'm coming back to Restream. And y'all, we're using a new service tonight. And so all who knows what could happen? Anything could happen. Anything could happen. Anything could happen. Yay, it's a live event. It might be in the screen, but it is still a live event. It's a live event. And um, this is going to be a fun conversation. Kathleen is, I'm going to read a little bit of your bio. Okay. Uh, Kathleen Mandeville served as rector of St. Clement's Episcopal Church Off-Broadway Theater in Hell's Kitchen, New York City, and is ecumenical chaplain at Bard College. Uh, under her tenure as rector, St. Clement's founded the Clinton Peer AIDS Education Coalition, which evolved into the citywide agency of New York Peer AIDS Education Coalition, serving over 20,000 at-risk clients annually. Uh, she was the proprietor of a guest house retreat, Kathleen's Barn, wonderful place in Tivoli, New York, and is the founder and director of Ignivox Productions, whose mission is dedicated to spiritual, regional, and environmental witness through the arts. Ignivox produces community arts development programs in low-income housing complexes in the Lower East Side, East Village, and South Bronx neighborhoods of New York City as well as site-specific music and performance events in public spaces in and throughout the greater New York City area. Kathleen also serves as executive director of Sacred Music New York, an organization Not which... Was... <laughs> okay. Just to say. <laughs> Served. <laughs> An organization which fosters social change through an immersive celebration of spiritual music. Uh, and yes, Kathleen has long been engaged with the creation of community through the integration of performance, landscape, program, hospitality, and ceremony. Uh, she received a Bachelor of Arts. Did I say that? Did I, my, did I slur? She received a Bachelor of Arts from Bard College and a Master's of Divinity from Episcopal Divinity School, Cambridge, Massachusetts. She is an ordained Episcopal priest in the Diocese of New York. Currently, she divides her time between the gritty, vibrant streets of the Lower East Side in New York City and the stunning vistas of the Hudson River Valley, New York, which is where we met. So that's Kathleen Mandeville. I'm so thrilled that you're doing this with me tonight. Tim Dillinger, here we are. Here we well. Let's talk a little bit about your work. Let's talk about your work with, as a producer, sure. your work as a minister, your work in the arts, your work in community building, mm -hmm. and how those things coalesce. Well, I was thinking yesterday as I was preparing for this a little. Um, you know, it's really interesting in life. I'm 66, so part of coming to the rightness of uh, this age is you get to see the great narrative sweep of your life in some ways. And ever since I can remember, I've been producing in one way or another, even in with neighborhood kids growing up, some kind of an event. I mean, I'm always doing events of one sort or another. And in some way I call what I do church of the event. Mm -hmm. And even with the live streaming opportunity now and the challenge of that because I'm a I'm an embodied kind of person and I'm a live event producer for a reason yes um, but I have to keep reminding myself 
that the screen is just another venue. And every venue has its challenges and its opportunities. And we're in such a pivot point now with this. And um, so this is not talking about my work exactly, but, but here I am, I was preparing for this and I was like, oh, I wanna be able to see and feel people and where are they and how do I touch everybody? And here we are in this distilled, but nonetheless live place. And, and yeah. everything that we do in life is really about coming alive. And so my work and my events have always been about activating the spirit and community and and touching that place where creativity makes us a community where we come together in the spirit to have a transformative experience and get ignited. And um, it's no accident that some of my research and thinking about Jade and Sarsaparilla relates to just this powerful theme that is part of what I've stood for my entire life. Well, and I think we have to go to, um, well, I want to actually start with how you found women's music, you know, as a uh, young woman, how did women's music and feminism come into your life? Well, you know, I'm 66, right? So I went to college, 1972, 1976, and and I remember the summer between senior year and I so I came out as a gay woman in high school, and I'm am honored to say that I helped found founded the first Cincinnati. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, the first uh, active gay organization in Cincinnati, Ohio, when I was in high school, and. Um, Wow. And then when I went to Bard, I was also one of the founding members of the first gay and lesbian um, club, as it were, at Bard College. Okay. And it was the, I mean, we had consciousness raising groups and, you know, I'm a child of the 60s and the 70s and the ferment of radical innovation and activism um, was part of the world, the this was the womb that I grew up in. And so, I mean, I had the, how shall I put it? I don't want to say advantage, but I had the self-consciousness around the fact that I was a gay woman in high school. And I didn't have a big struggle about coming out. Okay. It wasn't a fraught experience for me, particularly. I've had other fraught experiences in my life around other issues, but that wasn't really one. I just kind of knew who I was there. And and I grew up being imprinted by music. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is the birthplace of the second oldest opera company in the United States. And there's a conservatory there. And my mother took me to symphony and opera since the time I was five years old. And so I was deeply imprinted as with music mm -hmm. as a, a vehicle of powerful expression. And so I remember, I, I remember like, the first time I heard Lavender Jane Loves Women, I was at a party, you know, and in those days, you know, you gathered around the record player and we were listening to this and we were all like, what the fuck, man? This is, wait, this is my music. This is my story. This is being told. And so, you know, and then it just grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, it, it took off like a contagion, really. It was, it was, and in those days, we have to remember, it was pre-internet, of course. So it was all about word of mouth. And um, you get together and you listen to this music. And yes. so it was a powerful, powerful experience of how the story of who you are is is being played out in the musical life and you hear your experience literally in the music that's 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 taking on and it, it it was i mean it's a legacy and even now a lot of young lesbians or, or people that are even my age they don't really know about this whole foundation of women's music women producing their own music you know olivia records i mean some crossover like holly near people know her but the ferment and diversity of it yes. and the reach of it was profound. And it's a foundation and it's a foundation that 
you know, contemporary, like somebody like Katie Lang, all of this, you know. Stands on top of it. It does. I mean, there's a whole thing called the morphogenic field, which is the foundational energetic field and then how that evolves and the next people come in already with that energy foundation laid. And so much of the music that's contemporary now and women who have so much diversity of recognition, still a struggle, was influenced by the foundation of the legacy of women's music and how it evolved. And for me, it was a catalyzing experience um, that led me partly to my work as a music producer today. Not only, I have other influences, but that was a foundational one. What was the, for you, the marriage between the music and the message? Like how much of it was centered around the fact that this was music. And it's, I compare it a lot of times, and this is kind of a, a funny comparison when you look at how polarized that world is, but yeah. I compare it a lot to Christian music. Oh, right. Because yeah, that's, that's right. Well, that's Michael Beck's question for you because, I mean, that's not an accident, right? Um, and what is that, right? Like, why is that the comparison that, that you make? Because I think I mean, we all know that music is the, the universal language of the spirit. Yes. And crosses every culture dimension and in some ways, in the more polarized the world is, the more music comes to fore as the yes. as the expression of the spirit that is transgressive across all polarized boundaries. And so yeah. every movement, we know this, every movement has its has its music, right? And yes. and I mean, that's why I'm, that's why you do the work you do. That's why I do the work I do because music has the potentiality to, to reach in ways that we can't, we can't reach any other way. And so for women's music at the time, you know, it wasn't just the music. I mean, women were taking control of sound production. I mean, the women's music festival in Michigan and in Ohio and college campuses and women were producing the music with and for themselves. And it allowed the autonomy of women's powerful presence to be expressed, not just musically, but having control over how and in what way this was gonna be disseminated into the world. And so that's a very foundation of, of feminism. And, and the message of that was, we, we have the music and we are gonna produce the music and we're gonna share the music and that reads in the music. I mean, you feel that, right? Totally. totally. I mean, I think, you know, I make the I make the comparison. Yes. In that sense here. Because uh, it is message oriented music mm -hmm. in forms. Uh, but secondly, it was it came about through the channels that it came about uh, through for the same reason. Because mm -hmm. major record companies weren't interested in funding um, religious music right. and be feminist music. You know, women, they were not interested in putting money in those two things. Mm -hmm. And so there's yet both genres cover uh, a wide range of styles and a wide range of people. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there is a, um, common line, you know, that puts these two things together, mm -hmm. the common bond. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, I think, all looking for music that speaks to the things that we believe in. Yes. Yes. Not just tells us how we should feel, mm -hmm. and what scenarios we should put ourselves into to feel mm -hmm. like the rest of the world, but to actually have music, and this is what women's music, I think, does so well, mm -hmm. is that it forces you to hear and imagine the world differently. Yes. It's not just dogma. It is about heart and emotion. And um, I mean, I think about science fiction when I hear women's music, because when you hear it, 
it's a completely different world than the one that those of us who hold different values go out in the world and experience. Yes. Science fiction. That's a great reference, right? Right. So I, we, we lead up to that to say like women's music informs you as a producer in many ways, informs you as an activist in many ways. How did you, you know, sometime in the early to mid seventies then discover an album that was, on the periphery mm-hmm. of women's music. Yes. Well, you know, Tim, I don't exactly remember how this album came to me. I mean, I I was living, after I graduated from Bard, I moved to Provincetown. And I mean, again, I, music was my passion. So, you know, this is my LP archive of women's music. Hey, New Harmony. I mean, you know, there's wow. so much stuff here, right? I mean, I could go through all these. We're not going to do that. I see I, Castleberry I, Dupree on the bottom. Oh, yes, Castle. I mean, there's so, Robert Flower, there's so much. Oh. I mean, I was like, you know, inhaling whatever I could get my hands on and whatever came out, I was like going to buy it, right? And so I believe, I mean, Jade and Sasparilla um, were, they were Cape oriented. That's where they were living, as far as I know. and. Um, Submarine Records uh, produced this. And I think, I think there was a record store in Provincetown. I mean, I must have, I was living there in 1976. And this album came out, I think, in 1975. Is that right? Um, and I got it and I listened to it and I was like, and there's a reason why this one stuck for me. Now, I've listened to a lot of other stuff, but there's something here in particular about who they are. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Mm-hmm. Why? What is it about this album in particular in the women's music archive that kind of grabbed me in the way that I would be grabbed? And um, so that was my first experience with Jane and Sasparilla. And, and it's, you know, this album is hard to find now. I mean, it's yeah. completely scratched. I was listening to it this week, re-engaging it, and it's... It's so scratched, but even the scratches is kind of like, well, you know, it's like my wrinkles, you know, it's kind of like, right, it's well-loved and been played thousands of times. So, That's right. good, you're putting out how to download it. Yes, it is available on available. music now. Yes, it is. Um, um, what in, because you had heard women's music, like you yeah. heard Alex Dobkin, you right. mentioned Lavender Jane Loves Women with the yeah. great Alex Dobkin and Kay right. Gardner. Right, it's the beginning, right. So what was it about, because we also, there's a thread here that I think we're going to raise yes. before we go very deep, because I know one of the things that had to have grabbed you was the cover of Gonna Take a Miracle, mm-hmm. uh, which many of us first heard by right. Laura Nero and LaBelle. Yes. Right. Yes, Laura Nero is, you know, the 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 initial well from which so much women's music, uh, so much music has drawn its its its, you know, vitality. Right? I mean, we could talk. We could do a whole show on Laura Nero. Um, right. And I mean, I was at Bard. I remember the women's dorm. You know, we would all put on, we would all put on "Gonna Take a Miracle," Laura Nero, and we'd be listening to her. Right. I mean, that that album in particular is the sexiest fucking album there is. I mean, you want to seduce somebody, you put that album on. It was right. known. It's like, OK, all right. All right. I think I'm interested in you. What are we going to put on? We're going to put on Laura Nero, going to take a miracle album. And, you know, it was like whatever. It was almost kind of. Well, it was <laughs> one of those things. Right. You know, so, um, so, yeah, that that particular and their cover that they do is just Spectrum. on unbelievable right just on knocks it out of the park i mean laura's version is incredible but to hear these two women sing it to each other with their vocal conversancy and janet hood's amazing amazing stride piano i mean linda langford is when you listen to her her control anyway it just yeah well should we before we go too deep should we play it yeah let's play it people hear it and by the way Anybody watching, shoot questions in. We are seeing comments from all of the uh, 
from all of the outlets that we're on, we can see your comments. So please, if you've got questions or comments, please share them and we will um, acknowledge them and talk about them and help them, let them help guide the conversation. Yeah. We are gonna share one track from this wonderful album by Janet Hood, Linda Langford. Uh, and this is their cover of It's Gonna Take a Miracle. And I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to mute myself so that we don't uh, interfere with the audio. And we're just going to go to heaven for like six minutes and yes. 39 seconds or so. It's really one of the most amazing things. And we'll talk about, um, well, we'll have, we've got a lot to say. So <laughs> <You think? laughs> after this song, yes. You might want to mute Kathleen.
are back. Now, maybe you couldn't quite get it all through the screen, but let me tell you, like listening to that, it's like, it's like, like I, I'm, I'm ready to take off my clothes and run in the woods or run on the beach or yeah. if you can't feel the, the erotic vitality and the control that Linda Langford's voice has, I mean, it just, and it's going to take a miracle, and that's a message. I mean, it is. This song is many things, but it is partly about redemption. You know, it's a partly about what you lose and what you're willing to do to continue to find it, and what happens when you do find it, and the power of that. And yes. I mean, ladies and gentlemen out there, whoever you are, like after this, if you're watching this get on the phone, write a letter, connect to somebody that somehow maybe you hurt or lost, or this is a song that is about redemption and connecting to the heart. And I just, it's a mandate, right? So just a, just a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, and I think we have to put it in a political and yes. cultural context too, because to have two women who were together, they were a couple. Yes. Of them singing this song. To each other. To each other. Cover. Completely shifts, A, what the song means. Yes. And B, the kind of declaration that it is. Yes. Because it's not just them to each other, it's also societal. Yes. They're also singing it, you know, as part of, in my mind, and I yeah. could be wrong, I can't speak for them or what they intended, but to me, it is also a part of the liberation message. Yeah. It's gonna, there is no reparative therapy. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's going to take a miracle. Yes. And so I yeah. think there's- Right, it's, it's kind of like semi-ironic in a way, yeah. It's going to take a miracle. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so there's just such a power, uh, A, in that song, which mm -hmm. we already felt from Laura and LaBelle. Mm -hmm. But then to have them sing it, it becomes, it's a becoming. Yes. 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 And so, you know, I just, I have to insert right yes. here, like, I heard this song 2000. 11 you brought this to my house because you are i i jokingly am going to call you a jaden sarsaparilla 
uh, evangelist. That's right. I have. That's right. Because you really, you from one of the first conversations we had, you were insistent that I hear this. Then you brought it to my house. I'll never forget it. And you played this first. I didn't hear the rest of the album. You played this first. Mm -hmm. And I was um, laid out. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's such an amazing piece of work. Just this song. Just and then, of course, and then, of course, I listened to the whole album. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's such a um, mastery yes. of these two women, uh, Janet Hood, who's on piano, and I'm assuming doing the bulk of the arranging mm -hmm. uh, of these songs. And then on top of that, Linda Langford, really, like Linda Langford, where are you today? Where, where are, you? are you? Where are you? Because that voice... That voice, and I'm going to put this up again because I really just want to push people to please go to amoeba.com and download this album because you're going to be blown away. So, you know, let's give people a little, I, mean, I feel like we're, you know, it's very ecstatic because <laughs> it's hard to come down. I've got to take, going to take a miracle. It's true. It's so most of the songs on this album were written by Bill Russell, who might be watching tonight. Hi, Bill. Hi, Thanks Bill. Music. Yeah. 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 Um, who also managed uh, Janet and Linda. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Janet uh, is a, a, a pianist, accomplished pianist, mm -hmm. and today, you know, also, and back then also already was a composer. Yes. Um, and uh, many people, if you don't know anything else of her work, uh, you know, Elegies for Angels, Punks, and Raging Queens, mm -hmm. uh, and written with Bill Russell. Yes. Years, a decade later. Yes. Um, and then Linda Langford, they uh, met, Janet and Linda met uh, at Oberlin Conservatory of Music. Right. And started working together in local bands mm -hmm. and uh, came into a relationship. Mm -hmm their first uh, lesbian relationship and started gigging in 1973 mm -hmm. uh, as Jaden Sesperilla. Mm -hmm. And I like saying the R, so I always say, uh, you know, anyways. Uh, You're a Southern boy, aren't you, darling? Uh -huh. I am. Uh -huh. uh, album came out in 76 and we've got some other details, but that's just a, for those watching that have no context for this album or what this is. And so the other thing that I think we really have to make clear is that this was a unique album, even for women's music. Yes. And we should talk about why. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. yes. Much of most 99.9% .9 of women's music was made by all women. Right. Uh, the, no men were participating in the creation of the albums and in many cases, even down to the printing of the albums, mm -hmm. um, the design of the jackets. Uh, they were trying to get women's printing plants at certain yes. points. And so, you know, untouched by man's hands. Mm -hmm. and so uh, this album was different because yeah. Bill was writing the lyrics. Yes. Yes. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I think... You know, I said there's this whole thing about the autonomy of women and women's music and all of us doing it together in a way. And yet, how do I want to say this? This is a subtle point, but it's a really important one in my mind, given some of the polarity that we're experiencing today. Um, and let me just see if I can get this. Whatever any, this is my opinion, political social movement becomes so dogmatic, if you will, you know, you end up eating the menu and not having the meal. And yeah. so part of what I think is somewhat unique about these two, at least for me, is, I mean, I'm not really interested in an all women, all gay environment. Personally, diversity is where I live and where I get activated. That's true of music. That's true of people. That's true of context. You know, my work as a producer is always about um diverse expression demographically and culturally in any case. And there's a reason for that because it matters in this world. Um, so part of what was happening in those times, you have to sort of remember, and again, when I look at, you know, gay culture now, what's happening now and all of the non-binary and many of the dimensions of this, 
at that point in 1976, I was graduating from Bard. You know, you didn't do anything that was heteronormative. I mean, right. you, you know, it was, which femme, any of that chemistry. I mean, you know, you you did not. That was like, mm, mm, mm. you know, everybody had short hair and you wore flannel shirts. And, and that was kind of it. That was the costume. And, and in those days, we understand things evolve. And, and I'm... And so part of what's amazing about them is that they're highly elegant. They're very sexy and they're yeah. consummately trained musicians. I mean, you can tell that you can see yeah. that they're, I mean, I have some other performers I've worked with who went to Oberlin and I, you feel that, right? They're not just the folk idiom. There's a diversity of musicality and styles in this album. And because of Bill Russell, who has, Again, and Bill, if you're watching, I, I, I don't know your work so, so well, but I do know of you in many ways. And, you know, the music theater, cabaret, art song components that are in this, this is not just sort of a political activism folk album. This is an album that's done by musical professionals who have a diversity of style. And they are, some of the songs, the way they're talking to each other is very transgressive, but it's all part of the eros of their musicality and who they are. They're not trying to make the statement. They are the statement. They are, that's right. Right? And, and, and the music reflects that. And the fact that the, the music theater component that I know Bill Russell kind of brings in here um, makes it to me more interesting, and and that feeds my whole passion around music theater. And I kind of live my life like it's a musical, so I mean, I respond to that. And there's, if you're going to listen to the album, you know, there is a honky tonk country. There's a kind of almost like shape note song. There's kind of jazz inflected. It's got an incredible diversity of style That's right. in it. And that reflects the sophistication and musicality of who these two women are. And, you know, they are unabashedly, they're not, they don't have short hair. Not that that matters, but they, they were elegant and sophisticated. And you could see that they were transgressive in the movement in that way. Yeah. And Bill Russell, it's like, hey, we're working with who turns on the music, man. And I don't know. To me, that's a kind of... Uh, there's something important about that. And I'm not saying that it was so dogmatic, but they didn't hesitate to be who they were, right? Musically and erotically and, and, and you know, physically. Presentation wise. Right, right. And, and Sorry, go but, ahead. Well, I was gonna go on. Go ahead. Well, because I think the thing, and I, you, you told me that this would go very quick and I can see that we are, and so, I think I want to talk a little bit and I want us to talk a little bit about, cause you asked me in preparation, like, like, like why does this music still matter? Why got, what's the power and impact of Jaden Sesperilla? And of course you can't really talk about Jaden Sesperilla without talking about Bill Russell, which is, that's right. That's the thing. And, and, and Janet Hood and Bill Russell went on to collaborate in some incredibly powerful projects musically one of which is Elegies, which you mm -hmm. referenced. And for our audience, if you don't know what that is, and I've never seen a production of it, and I had some idea at one point that Igni Vox might choose that as a vehicle for producing, but it, it came in the forefront of the AIDS movement and out of the AIDS quilt, which again, for all of us who were living through the AIDS drama that have impacted us profoundly, um, taking off of Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River, which is another amazing poetic expression of people speaking from the grave, as it were. And so they wrote this piece. And again, I've never seen it produced and I've listened to some of the music um, and it was, it was influenced that way. And it was performed in many different places. Um, it was in London, it was, on, it was in New York, but it's been adopted and produced in various places. And my good friend, Laura Hitt, I don't know, Laura, if you're listening, um, but she is a vocal coach and a performer and she had the, and I actually played Jaden Sarsaparilla for her way back when, and she went on to work at Boston Conservatory and she participated in a production of Elegies with Janet Hood, who wow. she knew about a little bit through Jaden Sarsaparilla 
wow. that, that Bill Russell directed and she performed and she said what happened in Elegies was this was the, it was during 9-11 and, and, and no, excuse me, it was, was it 9-11? Laura, maybe I got this wrong, but the power of this piece, Elegies, just like it brought the faculty and students together in Boston Conservatory. And so part of what I see in Jaden Sasparilla and Janet Hood and Bill, Bill Russell's work is this capacity to take the musical idiom and create music that is indeed transformative and redemptive that responds to the political ferment of the time, but from a, a, a kind of heroic, powerful, passionate place. And so, so this, and I'm going to say one more thing about that. Go for it. Which is, I've been thinking about COVID, of course, as we all have been. And, and so it's been in our idiom that something that goes wild is viral, right? And we all say that love and the spirit is contagious. And so we're living in a time right now where, you know, the literality of viral contagion is transforming our world. And so to me, why, why Bill Russell's work, why Jade and Sasparilla's work matters, why the legacy of women's music matters is because it represents the power of music to be the viral contagion of the spirit and transformation. And this is what we need as we transform the literality of COVID yes. into the contagion of the spirit to redeem and transform. And right. so, again, I mean, this is a little like talking about my heroes, you know, and here I am. But, I mean, I want to know, Bill Russell, Janet Hood, where are you? Like, is maybe, who knows what you're doing in life? I'm sure you're doing many things and are busy and, you know, full of it. But I want to hear... I want to hear a COVIDly expressed piece of music that the two of you might come together and and write because you have shown in your collaboration that you have the, the power to actually write music in the times, like Elegy is one of the best expressions that transforms and transmutes and tells the story of, you know, a complete time of ferment and brings it into uh, an elegiac witness. Yes. You got me doing my church rock over here, Kathleen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You're preaching good. You're preaching I know, good. I know. It's an occupational hazard, right? I know. That's <laughs> why you partly invited me. But, but I mean, really, like just in the last three days, I'm all these old intersections of connections around this little album has brought all kinds of dimensions from the past of my life into the present. And yes. And and so that's I mean. And I'm I'm all invigorated with this again, right? And well, I want to see what we're going to make now, right? That's the thing. Okay, good. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you raise a really important point because one of the things that Ray and I, I mean, this album is actually one of the reasons. Ray, say hi, Ray. Come in. Ray, Come in. Ray, let's see Ray. Hi, hi Ray. <laughs> one of the things that brought Ray and I together was not just, you know, women's music and the Radical Harmonies documentary. I mean, in the very beginning of our relationship, mm -hmm. and the song that brought us together was Gonna Take a Miracle, was wow. this album. Wow. And so, wow. you know, like this album that you brought me, uh -huh. you know, it's, 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 there's like these, there are these threads that, and we have used women's music in our life together. It has been the, really the ground really the ground. That's the only way I know to describe it. I mean, we, you know, we, Meg Christian, we played Darshan and a uh, Valentine's song at our wedding. I mean, that was, that was our wedding music. That was all, we, that was our wedding music. Wow. And so women's music, you know, is this foundational thing that in any time we have had trouble, mm -hmm. and I don't mean trouble between us, trouble in the world. Like, yes. I'm at graduate school. What am I doing? You know, those kinds of moments. Yes. So oh, we've had a few of those. Yes, we know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You and I have shared some of those. Moments. Indeed. Yes. Women's music and gospel music are the two things I find myself in those times wow. going back to wow. because there is a spirit 
in that music that is not only hopeful, but it reminds me and probably you and many other people who watch and are listening and have been affected by this music to keep looking up, to keep imagining the world as we need it to be mm-hmm. and not being completely um, blindsided by the quagmire. Yes. So that we find ourselves in, whether it's personal, whether it is you know societal, whether it is women's music and gospel music, those two forms are the two uh, things, again, that mm-hmm. provide those glimmers uh, of keep imagining, keep thinking about what it can be. What can you create from this? Because if, you know, these women could create this music with little money, mm-hmm. uh, with all the odds stacked against them. Yes. What can we not do? Yes. What can we not do? And so I think when we hear this album, you raised something I wanted to point back to as yeah. well. There is a authenticity. Yes. Janet and Linda on this album and the way they present, when you put on that first song, She's the Kind of Woman. Right. I wish we could play it. Right. Uh, but when you put on She's the Kind of Woman, you don't know, you know, unless you're staring at the lyric sheet. Right. Which, by the way, this beautiful insert in this album, this is yeah. everything about this album is, as you said, so elegant and yep. so well done. Yes. Uh, but when you put on that first song, you don't know where it's going. You don't know what's, what they're getting ready to tell you. And you get, you know, you're listening to their voices. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, they're singing. Oh, they're singing to each other. Other. Right. Yeah. And it is such a authentic um I don't feeling that's not a very you know elegant word. The feeling is so natural you don't question it. Correct. You you can guess it, you don't blink about it. And maybe for some gender loving people, it's a different experience. And so you hear it and it is natural for you. Maybe someone else who's not same gender loving would not have that experience listening to this album, but I would argue that you probably would hear this and just Oh yeah. I've played it for quote unquote straight people. (laughs) I have, and they equally get, you know, yeah. they, they get the sense of authentic musicality, right? And the vocal chops of each of them, the musicality, the competency, the harmony, the, the way they hook in, their entrainment, right? Um, and that they're actually singing their relationship, right? And see, and a very, again, sort of non like, I am a lesbian and you're gonna get the political message out of this. It's more comes out of the true arrows of the music that clearly is their connection. And and and, and they're funny too. Like in She's That yeah. Kind of Woman, you know, I was listening to it just earlier today and I thought, wow, this is the way I want to think about what I would dream to use your imaginal, like why, how to create a world that I am creating that this music shows me. This is the kind of relationship I would like to have, right? I mean, yes. she's the kind of woman to show me where I'm at to make me aware of how I'm growing. And then, you know, it, it, it rocks out a little. And then at the end, it's like, wait, it's like they're- Ecstasy. She, she's, and she make me, right? She makes me aware. And then you hear, they go off stage, you can hear them echo and they're like going, and they're saying like, make me, make me right now. You know, it's like a complete sexual, like hot thing. You know, they've just been singing and they're going off to like make each other, but they're laughing, right? And it's, yeah. it's, um, I mean, that's a piece of artistry that is in the production that they hold. And um, it's a simple thing, but it's, I don't know, it's these kinds of little moments that let, let you know that this is, you're, you're listening to consummate professionals, right? Yeah. Totally. Right. And they're playing the genre as they're performing it, right? That's the kind of cabaret compo- component that's well, really I wanna, powerful. I want to quote Bill Russell here because yeah, I think, you know, there's an important political thing I think we have to raise you know, uh, with this album as well, because they also, and let's talk about this, and yeah. not in addition to their appearance being one of the things, and the fact that Bill was their lyricist that sets them apart from women's music. They got criticized, which yeah. I find really interesting, by um, women's music critics for not yeah. being political. And I listen to this album and I hear nothing but a political act. Totally. And so 
uh, Bill said this a few years ago in a uh, 2016 interview, and I thought this was so great. He said, to this day, Jaden Sesprilla is one of the things I'm proudest to have been involved with. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was kind of revolutionary. The first gig was in 1973, Watergate was going on. Mm. I came out, everything was happening so fast. Mm -hmm. and so I think it's important to raise that, you know, even though this album came out in 75, 76, that this was still part of that early 70s political, you know, hotbed that this yeah. came out of. Yeah. And there's one song I really want to raise <laughs> because I feel like, in that, when you're talking about, you know, uh, Janet and Bill, you know, again, rising to the moment in COVID, I look at, I need a drink of water in my mind. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I go, well, it doesn't matter that, and I'm going to read the lyric because yeah. I think it's important to raise this. Mm -hmm. There's uh, some, you know, you get the sense of how timeless yes. our messages are. Yes. So thought I had a problem, thought that I was sick, a ludicrous idea in a, a country, country run by oh dick. My dick yes first ran to the preacher then ran to the shrink they screamed you need repair work your love is out of sync mother was embarrassed father was upset they wanted me committed or treated by a vet i refused both invitations and ran into your arms knowing i was damned to hell when heaven sent your charms and I need a drink of water in my mind. It's dirty from the way our love's defined. Can't seem to get it clean with smoke and wine. And I need to drink your water in my mind. I could not live without you. I had to live in shame. Guilty and embarrassed that our plumbing was the same. <laughs> a camera caught us playing. The plumber was a spy. In the eye of the beholder is where perversion lies. Yeah. And I drink of water in my mind. In this lonesome cell, I realized that something was amiss, something very different from the rightness of our kiss. It's a major revelation that the world itself is lewd, and it ain't just by each other that we are being screwed. screwed. Yes. That is political music. Yes. Yes. Thank you for reading that, right? Yeah. Um, 2020. Yeah. Right. Send your children to school. Right. Say say it again. Send your children to school. Yeah. You know, like here we are, like it is all connected. Yes. To yes. The political nature, particularly of this country mm -hmm. and um, where we are in this moment. Mm -hmm. And, I know that, you know, the country run by Dick was a pun on Richard Nixon at the time. Yes. I look at it today and I go, this is where we are. Yes. Yes. This is where we are once again. So thank you, Bill Russell. Yeah. Because I need a drink of water in my mind. Oh, yeah. What are you drinking there? This is drinking there, Tim? Uh, Argentinian wine tonight. Yes. Is it a particular brand? Um, it's called. Ray's going to get the bottle. Uh huh. Ah, this is the Seeker. It's not, Ar it is Argentinian. The Seeker. Mm -hmm. And it's Delicious and Malbec. It's a Malbec, Malbec right? Uh -huh. And the, uh, the recommend it. The speaker, very appropriate. Well, you know, I even look for spirituality oh. in my world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, but let's also talk about the. Where's our list? Well, I had sort of a question for you, but you go okay. ahead with what, go for it. Well, so because you are so specifically have been involved in the, I mean, here you are doing like, for instance, this program, right? Mm -hmm. You have been so involved in the archive and promotion, if you will, of women's music. And I want people out there to know that, like, I mean, you know, way more than I, right? Way more. And, um, and I, I guess what I want people to hear is what that's about for you, why? And, you know, I mean, you made the reference to gospel, but something about your background in relation to this. And so, like, and what are you doing with it? Or how, what, I don't know, say more about this incredible passion that you've developed and actually pursued with, you know, all of your skill and artistry yourself. Well, I 
women's music came into my life right around the, you know, the time you brought it to me. And then shortly after that, if you remember, I had a really intense medical crisis mm -hmm. um, that was uh, connected to what I had been through as a result of um, really years and years and years of patriarchal abuse. Yes. And so when I was, you know, on bed rest for five months, that beginning of 2012, I'll never forget it. Not being able to hardly walk. You remember that. Yes. Um, found a documentary called Radical Harmonies right after, again, right after you had brought Jaden Sesperilla to my house mm -hmm. and uh, saw Radical Harmonies and heard um, really Meg Christian's voice. Yes in that documentary and something grabbed me in that bed and I'll never mm -hmm. forget it. And I wanted to know everything I could and get as many albums as I could mm -hmm. uh, because I knew there was something transformative mm -hmm. in that sound. All I knew was the sound. I didn't know what the lyrics were at that mm -hmm. point at all. I, I'd seen the documentary and, that, and then I saw Sweet Honey in the Rocks documentary, okay. Ratio, at the same time. They were both on Amazon Prime at the time. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And um, those two documentaries, I watched them over and over and over and over and over wow. that month, two months, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, until they went away <laughs> and then I had to buy them. Mm -hmm. uh, but those were my beginnings because it was almost like salvation yes. in a sense because I recognized I had some, as we would say in church, stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, and so this music was retooling my mind mm -hmm. and sending me to um, feminist theory mm -hmm. and, you know, making me read and making me evaluate my experiences mm -hmm. uh, with men. And I don't mean just men in a, a relationship standpoint, mm -hmm. men, how I engaged with men in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a, you know, typically read as more feminine. Yeah. Uh, male. Yes. And so I, it began to really make me see the world differently. Mm -hmm. And so women's music became a passion because I found such a lifeline in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's changed, it has changed my life mm -hmm. in such a uh, immediate way. Mm -hmm. um, because I would have never, I mean, Bray and I've been, we're on how many years? Six years of marriage, you oh, know. Congratulations. You know, and I would have never, uh, neither of us would have been in this relationship without feminism. And so, you know, it is a, um, I keep using the word transformative. I do know more words, but uh, that's the only, it's the best word I can think of to talk mm -hmm. about what feminism and women's music really represents. And I see why it grew in the way that it did. Yes. Because I can't imagine being a woman mm -hmm. in the seventies and the eighties and hearing this for the first time in the world mm -hmm. and what that would do to my perception. Yeah. 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 It was a, just a profoundly imprinting moment. Well, what are you, what are you like going to do with all this, Tim Dillinger? Well, I thought, uh, I was, that's what I was going to school for. I thought, mm -hmm. and uh, I got to school and I realized that the Academy was um, without spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only way I really know how to say it yeah. uh, and would be deadly to me if I stayed. Yeah. And so I, uh, and one of my professors is here tonight, Robin Sheridan, who also uh, was a, oh my God, life changer for me in college at SUNY New Paltz. Huh. Uh, she's an amazing, amazing teacher from the South. And so we bonded on being, you know, exiled in the North when we were there. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I had teachers like that who, you know, encouraged me and saw something in me, but I got to graduate school and just went, this is not my path right. uh, I need to be able to um, help introduce music to people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stay exiled in this academy and become canonized and um, threatened because, you know, the world 
the real people, the everyday people in the world, you know, those of us that still work nine to fives and mm -hmm. you know, have to do that. Like mm -hmm. these are the messages everyday people need. Mm -hmm. So we moved, Ray and I moved from Massachusetts. Ironically, we were in Massachusetts for a very short period mm -hmm. and um, moved back to Nashville. And so the last you know year and a half for us has really been, what do we do mm -hmm. with what we know? And so this series came about because mm -hmm. of that. Yep. As a response yeah. to the pandemic to say, yeah, this is a good time to point people to music that's going to um, retool their thinking because we have um, elements coming at us in every moment now, whether it's on the internet or whether it's when we turn on the news or whether it's when we read a news article that is trying to tell us um, what is so. Yes. And um, I have to remember what I know about the world. Yeah. who information filters through, uh -huh. how it comes to us and what, you know, who has an agenda to get me thinking a particular way. And so, you know, this is the time for women's music, I believe, again, to emerge. And I'm loving seeing so many of the women's music artists doing live. Yes. I saw McCalla, Diane Davidson, uh -huh. Chris yeah. Williamson. I mean, right. if you follow Olivia Travels, like, right. They're performing, they're doing lives, they are bringing messages to the people. Teresa Troll, Teresa Troll, Teresa Troll. So, you know, there's there's wonderful, um, you know, these women, and at the, you know, as a lot of these women are now reaching their 60s and 70s, yeah, right. to me, this is the time we yeah. especially need, still need their voices. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. And so even this broadcast, this here you are, it's taking possession of the field, you know, like, okay, we could I mean everybody's here in some way and we engaging the That's right. The live stream and all of it. But here it is, it's like, all right, you're what I hear you say is we're not gonna leave it to X, Y, and Z. You, Tim Dillinger and and you have invited me, and so it's a great opportunity for me to speak right. some of these issues that, in a way, you know, I talk about all the time, but I don't get to explore them in the way that we are tonight. And to have made all these connections around this album, and to see having played it for people, you know, and having produced little pieces of it, having played it for people, and uh, and seeing that it still matters, right? Because sometimes I look at my work and I go like, well, you know, Kathleen, you know, you've done this and that, and you never know. You That's right. Never know. Sometimes the seeds that you plant, the music you play, the event you created, the work you've done, and the way it has its lasting impact. And so I hope whatever Bill Russell and Janet Hood and Linda Langford, you know, in whatever way, if they ever hear about this, that we that we know that their work matters. That's right? right. And it continues to matter. Right. And fingers crossed, like yeah, enough, mm -hmm. you know, fingers crossed that. You know, this album can be more widely available. Exactly. It's on a now I'm going to put this up again. But, you know, we need this on uh, iTunes. We need this on yeah. you know, the streaming channels. People need to be able to have quick access to find this and to be, uh, as I said with Rhiannon and last week, to be transformed. Yes. Um, talk, talk about, um, for you as a producer, um, if somebody wants to get in touch with you about mm -hmm. collaborating mm -hmm. uh, or producing an event yeah. or creating community as a consultant, yeah. um, I'm going to put your link up again. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you can meet with people, you know, as we're in a pandemic and talk with them and, you know, work with them? Well, thank you for that opportunity, Tim. So, um, you know, my, my, bread and butter work is producing community arts development events in low income housing in the South Bronx and Lower East Side. And that's on a, you know, a definite hold. However, I continue to work with musicians. I'm working with the two women right now, Barely Lace. They're amazing. I mean, you can go to my Instagram, Igni Vox. I have a lot of, a lot of stuff there um, uh, where we're actually going out into nature, singing to and for nature. And I'm videotaping them and we're doing it all one shot. Um, so what I'm just saying is that I never stop trying to find the 
place where music intersects with the spirit and and creating opportunities. So, and I am thinking, trying, maybe, no, I'm not trying. Don't say you're trying, Kathleen. I am intending to, to work on something called capturing lightning in a bottle, uh, creating radical radical magic in production because really production's a whole spiritual practice because I'm a priest. I, I approach everything from a spiritual place and it's a technology production as it confronts us deeply. So I'm, uh, and I, and I've been informally coaching any number of people and projects here in the Hudson river Valley and in New York. And, and so it's my favorite thing to sit and talk with somebody about what their vision is. Yes. Help them find the vision, be with the vision and then think about implementing it. Um, Cause producing is about first, Thinking about what wants to happen. Sometimes we just leap over and do it. No, it's what wants to happen. And that's a real discernment in the heart. And then, and then, and then making it happen, right? So in any case, I love to talk about these things. You want to talk to me? Hey, find me on my website. Call me up. I still say I'm in my 60s. I still answer my phone. That's right. I'll text everybody, but, you know, call me up. Well, and Kathleen, I will say, is just an incredible spirit. And, uh, you know, you've changed my life. And uh, I am so grateful for particularly the time we got to be one-on-one -on -one yes, and uh, spend time together at a uh, really critical time in, in our lives. Yes, we were both having it. Having it. <laughs> we were. <laughs> we were. So yeah. I'm really <laughs> now look at us. Not in the James rule away. Yes. <laughs> right. And we, it was gonna take a miracle and it was. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I'm so grateful for your friendship and so grateful for the music that you brought in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I really encourage people to reach out to Kathleen, and she's a great great soul, a great mind, a great creator. And um, I think you've got so much more to do in the world. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe there's going to be a going to take a, a Jaden Sesperilla event. Wouldn't that be great? It would I, be amazing. I think we need something. We need something. I don't want to put a label on it, but we need something. We need this Back. I is there a video? Are there vi is there video footage that exists? Does anything live? Where's the David Frost appearance? Because they yeah. were also on David Frost. Where is it? We yeah. need it. Where's we that's right. Okay. Let's well, there you go, Mr. Archive Researcher. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh -huh. So you know, if you've and anybody that sees this after it's over, if you have anything, we'd love to see it. We'd love to hear about it. We'd love to hear your stories right. uh, about seeing. I mean, if you go to YouTube, there's so many wonderful comments from people that experienced uh, Jaden Sesperilla in person. Uh, I mean, we found all kinds of amazing articles this week. I mean, even the recording of the album was documented in the Boston Globe. Mm -hmm. uh, just really, there's so much here. There's such a story to still be told. And uh, if Bill and Janet or Linda want to talk, Let's do it. We'll do another one on the album. We'll have another conversation. And let's have them talk. I feel a little like, oh my God, I'm talking about this. It's their work, right? So it would be great to hear what they had to say. That's right. Yeah. So we're just putting it out there. We're yeah. just putting it out there in the world and whatever happens uh, emerges, but everybody can do themselves the favor one more time and put it up of finding Jaden's Esperilla on amoeba.com. You can download it. It's exquisite. And uh, I can't wait to hear what you think of it. So just let me know. All right. We love you. We're grateful. I'll be back uh, August 20th with Tom Eubanks, author of Ghosts of St. Vincent. Uh, St. Vincent's, excuse me. And we'll be talking about the music of Lolita Holloway. Oh. Uh, great soul singer, disco artist who does not get enough acclaim. So we're going to be talking about her works on August 20th. And then August 6th, I'll be here with Patsy Moore. And we'll September 6th, you September mean, right? 6th, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, we're just going to be in August forever. Yeah. September 6th, uh, I'll be talking with Patsy Moore about uh, her latest album, the, the, the first and probably only uh, 2000 Anything album. We'll talk about what surprises <laughs> us. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Kathleen, I love you. Thank you, Ray, for all of your support and tech technology and all of it helping make this happen. That's Ray, right. Thank you. And thank Have you. Have a good night, everybody. And we Bye. will see you on the 20th. 
Excellent. Tim, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.